Hello, uh, my name is John Harlan. Uh, I'm going to talk about my recent work on learning missing dynamics from data. And first, let me acknowledge uh, my collaborators. So Xi Xiao Jiang is a former postdoc who will take a job at Shanghai Tech. Fahim Gilani is a fifth year graduate student. Sun Wei Liang is a graduate student of Hai Chao Yang uh, at Purdue. Basically, uh, the high dimensional simulations that involve uh, deep learning uh, methodology will, it, it will be produced, actually it was produced by Sun Wei Liang. And Dimitri Giannakis, who helps me understand the kernel methods. So this uh, work uh, is supported by ONR and um, NSF. So to avoid the distraction, I'm going to shut off the video here. I'll just, you know, go through the slide. Okay. So here's the plan of the talk. Okay, first uh, I will discuss a supervised learning perspective of reduced order modeling. Uh, in particular, I'd like to draw connections between Morris Wansik formalism, which is a natural way to represent reduced order modeling uh, with delay embedding theory uh, and the statistical regression. Then I'll discuss uh, kernel-based linear estimators uh, as basically a, a, a mean to discretize this approximation and provide a numerical demonstration based on these estimators. Uh, the second uh, part of the, the talk, if I will focus on formulating a general non-parametric closure modeling of missing dynamical systems. I'll discuss the pathwise convergence okay, of the proposed scheme here, and then uh, provide numerical demonstration with a neural network-based nonlinear estimator on high dimensional uh, example. Uh, and finally, also study uh, the parametric modeling paradigm that is found to be useful in problem specific, you know, with appropriate physical understanding. So in, in, in particular, I will show that uh, the parametric modeling paradigm uh, is a specific example of this proposed non-parametric closure framework. Okay. So here, uh, let me begin uh, this slide with few definitions and notations. And the goal is to basically review the discrete Morris Wansik formalism. Okay, so let me consider uh, the, a discrete dynamical system uh, given by this map phi on the phase space of omega, okay, equipped with invariant measure mu. Now, um, as a, this is basically a natural representation of dynamical systems in this case. Uh, as a discretization of ODE or PDE and so on. So now here I define a uh, map X here uh, as the observable that takes the phase space into some n-dimensional uh, real value component vectors. Typically uh, n is usually much smaller than the dimension of the phase space omega. So here, let me define P uh, to be an orthogonal projection of a uh, function in L2 space into a subspace V, where this is actually a space of function that can be written in terms of the observed variable X, okay? So the object of interest here is the Koopman operator U, uh, which uh, describes the induced linear actions of the dynamics of the observables, okay, as an element of L2 space, despite the nonlinearity of the map phi, okay. Um, in particular, uh, we define U iterate T times acting on observable X here is defined as compositions of X with the dynamics iterated T times. And for convenience of notations uh, of, of the future discussion, I'll denote this as xt, as if it's a random variable 
of x at time t. Okay. Now, if we denote uh, little xt as a realizations of this random variable, uh, which take the uh, state space omega at time t, then by Dyson formula, you can actually represent the uh, Koopman operator as such formulation. And, you know, with careful uh, algebra here, uh, basically just use the definition of the Koopman operator, you can decompose the right-hand sides into uh, three terms. First terms is the Markovian term, and then here's the summation is the non-Markovian, which usually called the memory terms. And the last term is just called the orthogonal dynamics. Since uh, this uh, term uh, lives in orthogonal to V uh, with respect to the inner product in L2 space. Okay, now uh, I should point out that uh, there are fast literature, okay, reporting various efforts to translate these representations into a numerically tractable computational model. Also, you should notice that the representation is not unique because it depends on the choice of P and P can be, you know, uh, non-unique uh, projection operator into its range space. Okay. And also uh, another important fact is that depending on the choice of P, the expression of this non-Markovian or and orthogonal dynamics can be very complicated or can be very simple. Okay. So in the next slide, I will basically review the delay embedding theory to motivate a, a particular choice of uh, projection operator P. Okay. So here, uh, let me de uh, define the delay embedding coordinate map as such. Okay. So basically by this script XM, okay, it map, you know, the omega to uh, the observable at time zero, at time minus one and so on. So here I use the notation X zero to be exactly equal to X using this particular uh, definition, which I put it here. Okay. Now uh, the main thing here is the following. The delay embedding theory states that under mild assumptions, okay, the this map script XM here uh, is a homeomorphism on the support of the invariant measure, which I denoted by the set M here, okay, for large enough little m. Okay, so what is this really means is 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 that uh, the Borel Sigma algebra of M is identical to the sigma algebra generated by this uh, delay coordinate map. So basically any measurable function on this measurable space of omega, B and mu uh, is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra. So specifically for our case is that if you take conditional expectation of uh, measurable uh, function x t plus one condition to you tell the, you know, you, you tell us the whole sigma algebra of x n, then this is exactly equal to x t plus one. Basically the randomness is disappear in this case, right? Or in other words, basically this conditional expectation operator is just an identity operator. Okay. So motivated by these observations, First, let us choose the projection operator in the Morrison's equation as such for large enough M such that the delay embedding theory uh, holds. Okay, here's the first observations. Okay, now QM, which is uh, the orthogonal op uh, uh, projection operator into the perpendicular space defined as I minus uh, PM is zero such that both the term memory and orthogonals terms vanish, right? So they go, they goes to zero. So in this case, basically the Mori Swansik equation simplifies to the contribution of only a Markovian in quotation mark here. Let me be careful. 
uh, term. So let me explain this. Basically, the Markovian term is just this term, right? And since we choose the P to be conditional expectation, then you can write it this way. Now, although this is a, an identity operator, okay, but if you look at it as a function of the arguments here of the conditions, it is actually a non-trivial function that depends on the delay coordinate variables. And this map M0, okay, first of all, it, it is, it is, uh, it, it, it is now non-Markovian. This is why I use the quotation mark. And, you know, second of all, this is also sometimes known as the flow map induced by the delay embedding, okay? Now, the important uh, uh, point of using this conditional representation, uh, expectation uh, notation is owing to the fact that the conditional expectation is a regression function. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that M0 here is a solution to a L2 minimization problem. Uh, in this uh, particular application, we are looking at the minimization problem to obtain uh, a, a map, okay, that takes the uh, that that basically takes the uh, covariate data here x x m, okay, to the response data of the observable at the future time in the L two sense, okay. So to to, to summarize here, the key point is that uh, the delay embedding coordinate induce a simplification of the uh, morris wanzig equation to find a target function, MO, okay? And this target function can be obtained actually by solving an appropriate supervised learning algorithm of solving this minimization problem, okay? Now in the next two slides, I'm going to uh, discuss how to empirically approximate this M0, okay, non-parametrically uh, using, you know, purely the data that are available, okay, or use, use, using the observable that are available to us, okay. So here, uh, in this particular uh, one, let me choose a particular example of how to approximate this conditional expectation, okay? So here it is. Uh, this is an, an example of a consistent linear estimator. This is proposed by Alexander and Giannakis recently. Uh, the idea here is basically to employ an interpolation, okay? In spectral projection uh, to coordinates of the basis of this uh, space L2 nu, okay? But uh, since L2 nu is not known in typical applications, basically they estimated the basis function by solving, so here's the basis function here, by solving eigenvalue problem of a discretization of a self-adjoint compact integral operator. Uh, now, since the basis on the training data set here is represented by this uh, discrete factor. So this is a discrete factor in this case. Okay, I noted by phi j n, just using exactly the notation. And in order to evaluate this uh, estimator on a new point, so you need to interpolate, okay? So in this case, they propose to use the Nistrom inter, uh, project, uh, interpolation method. So here's the, my notation. I just used their notation. This is the interpolations of these vectors, okay? So uh, what I found is that basically, you know, suppose if your target function M0 here belongs to a Sobolev, cl uh, Sobolev class uh, with uh, beta denoted the regularity of the functions, then you can have, you know, uh, 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 the following error bound, okay? The first term here, uh, is basically the Monte Carlo error. So this uh, L over N is just a Monte Carlo error for estimating these expansion coefficients, okay? Or in statistics, you call it the variance part. The second term here uh, is the error in estimation of this eigenfunction using these eigenvectors, okay? So here I just basically quoted the result from uh, Garcia-Trilos 
Uh, and the last term here is basically the bias due to the finite truncation of this representation by uh, leading L eigenfunctions. Okay, so if you balance the variance, which is the first and the bias terms, okay, we basically can achieve uh, the famous optimal minimax error bound uh, for linear estimators. So in this case, right, suppose if the target function M0 is as smooth as the dimension, so basically I'm saying if beta is equal to D, then suddenly uh, the error bound is N to the power of two third, or minus two third, which is independent of the dimension. So somehow you escape the curse of dimension, okay? Uh, however, in practice, right, the problem will actually arise in the estimation of eigenfunctions. So this second error bound will actually dominate, okay? Especially for problems where the required L here is large, then there is a fundamental computational difficulty for estimating eigenfunction correspond to large modes, okay, given only a finite amount of data. So, you know, to avoid this basically uh, solving eigenvalue problem, so here I, we propose a, a, an a, a alternative to this. So basically, we're going to use uh, an integral operator. So here I define the integral operator with a Markov kernel, okay, with a Markov kernel kappa. So here, uh, specifically, I will just use the Markov kernel that is constructed uh, using variable bandwidth kernel, uh, employing the uh, diffusion maps algorithm, okay? So the intuition here is as follows, okay? So suppose if I just replace this Markov kernel by a Dirac delta functions, then you exactly get M0, right? So this proposed method you can think of as a, you know, with the Markov kernel, is a sort of a regularizations of this uh, convolution operator or mollification, if you wish to use that language. So numerically here, uh, at least we found that, uh, let's say if the data lies on a smooth manifolds uh, with sampling density Q uh, defined as the radon nicotine derivative of nu with respect to the following measure, uh, then, you can have the following uh, point-wise error estimate uh, in probability. So here, uh, basically, the epsilon is just this uh, uh, error in this uh, in integral approximations. Now, the second term here, this error, is basically uh, the error of estimation of the sampling density because you know we usually don't know what is the sampling density. And then the last error term is just the discrete error estimator. So you can look at detail in my previous paper with Tyrus Berry uh, in Acha here, 2016. Numerically, uh, basically this particular estimator here, uh, let's say if you want to evaluate the estimator on a new point, then you, you just simply you know, apply this matrix factor multiplications where the component of the matrix here is given by the following. So if you need to evaluate that as the new point, then you just evaluate this kernel on the new point, okay? And M0 here is just the training, uh, it's a vector consists of the res uh, training data sets of the response, okay? So in this way, you avoid, you know, eigenvalue decompositions. So in the next slide here, I'm going to just give you a numerical demonstration. So here on five-dimensional uh, Lorentz 96 model, which is written as this uh, five-dimensional ODE, uh, this is a chaotic dynamical systems. It has two Lyapunov exponents and a tractor of dimension 2.9. Here, basically, uh, we will only observe one component, you know, one of these five, so call it the first component. Okay, so this is my observable X, it's just omega one. Now on the left panel, uh, what I'm showing you here is basically uh, the results of applying the smooth smoothing technique. Um, and uh, I'm showing you the trajectory of the, as a function of time. 
And you can see if we increase the lag embedding here, right? Parameter, which is, which is the, which is called, we call it M uh, in, in our estimator. So in this case, you can see the trajectory is getting uh, closer and closer to the truth. Okay. Now on the right panel, we check the robustness of this estimator using uh, root mean square error, average over uh, 10,000 out of sample data to see the robustness of this estimator. One can see that actually uh, as M increases, the RMSE decays accordingly. Uh, in this problem, you can also see actually the, uh, the smoothing method, which is given by the solid line here, is uh, better than the Nistrom uh, projection method. So for this particular uh, example, we suspect that the dynamics, you know, may require accurate estimation of eigenmodes that corresponding to very high wave number. So which is which is difficult here, you know, numerically to realize using only twenty thousand data points. Okay. So to conclude here, basically, this is I'm concluding the the first part of the talk, right? Basically, what we did is just we identified the target function for estimation, which is M zero in this case. And we, what we do is we rewrite, you know, this uh, problem of reduced order modeling in terms of conditional expectations, which allows us to access appropriate supervised learning tasks. Okay. So in the remaining part of this talk, I will employ exactly this principle, okay, to devise a closure modeling approach uh, for high dimensional missing dynamics. There, basically, we will also consider using neural network-based nonlinear estimator to solve this uh, supervised learning task. Okay. So, so here it is. So let me uh, describe what is the setup here. Okay. So let x and y denote the resolved and unresolved variables, respectively, uh, satisfying the you know, um, uh, the following dynamics, dynamical systems, okay? So X, the dynamics of X is given by this map of F, the dynamics of Y is given uh, by the map of G, okay? So we assume F uh, to be known, uh, G is unknown. So this is the missing dynamical component. So our task here is basically just to reconstruct the approximate dynamics that that can track the evolution of X, okay? And in some case, we will like to assess how well this uh, uh, closure model also uh, reconstruct the invariant statistical distribution of X, such as the density or auto covariance function and so on, okay? So given the following two constraints, okay? So case one, this is merely just to uh, understand the problem, uh, we assume that we are given the time series of X and Y, okay? Now case two, this corresponds to many real application where uh, we usually don't have information about Y. What we only observe is X, but in this case, uh, I will uh, explain that given X and the parametric model F, then one can, uh, construct, you know, or basically reconstruct a time series of theta, which I will uh, define as identifiable unresolved variable. So let me uh, not explain too much here and I'll, I'll just explain it later. What is this theta with a specific example? Okay. So now here, uh, let's go to the case one. For simplicity, let me just consider uh, uh, the dynamics as a discretization of SDEs using euler mariama scheme. So this is the Euler, this is uh, the parameter, uh, sorry, the variable C here is just a random realization of standard Gaussian random variables. So uh, they are uncorrelated, uh, Cx and Cy are uncorrelated. Um, now I highlighted the unknown, uh, which is the target function by red color for your convenience. So the task here is I'm going to rewrite this target function, okay, 
in terms of conditional expectation. And then as soon as I do that, then later on we can kind of come up with the appropriate uh, approximation to this. Okay. So first, G, right? You can you you, you notice this G, right? Uh, can can be uh, written as a conditional expectation to basically this is just a discrete approximation, uh, first order discrete approximation to the derivative of y with respect to t, right? Given x t and y t is such. Okay. So you know, rather than carrying this very complicated notation, so let me just simplify, I write it this way with like uh, uppercase of delta here, but this is just the same. So now let me, let me replace the G, the target function with, with this conditional expectation, okay? So here go on the top, I just replace this, okay? Now, uh, let us define the estimator for the target function g. So this is just the g, right? So now we define the estimator. So I use uh, epsilon with subscript, uh, sorry, expectation with subscript epsilon. So in this case, uh, epsilon is to denote an error in the appropriate sense, which I will discuss in the next slide, okay? Now, given this estimator, uh, we can use the residual of this estimate, okay, to basically estimate also sigma, Okay, so but using the residual, averaging the residual, you can estimate sigma with sigma y hat in this case. Okay, now here is the approximate. Sorry, here is the approximate uh, closure model. So basically, the approximate closure model is given by this equation. Okay, now you see I use the expectation with epsilon, and this is the hat. And everything here, I just denoted by uh, a hat to denote this is the approximate, okay? Theoretically, we can say as follows. So if this estimator, if this uh, expectation to the power of epsilon is a consistent estimator of the target function uh, here, okay, uh, in the sense that it will actually converge to the target function as epsilon goes to zero uh, with error bound of order epsilon square in variant sense. And for f and g, g Lipschitz continues in x and y, then, you know, under the same initial conditions, uh, you can expect that the trajectories, okay, of the, you know, uh, of, of the true dynamics, which is x, and the approximate dynamics will agree up to a finite time, okay? In this case, you know, basically the length of the accurate prediction is roughly, you know, uh, proportional to this learning rate epsilon to the minus a half. So depending on, 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 on the choice of the learning algorithm here will actually determine uh, the prediction accuracy length in time, okay? So later I will discuss specific estimator for this. So let me uh, give you an example. So here's a simple uh, example, just for an illustration. So in this case, uh, let's consider a two dimensional Langevin equation. And here I highlighted again the, my red color uh, to be the unknown, okay? So what you really, what we really have is just uh, X and, but from, from X you can actually get, uh, and, and the data of Y, okay? So in this case, right, um, basically, let me say the following. So here's two panels. We compare basically specific trajectories. So the true trajectories are given by the green color here. So the other color, color denote the estimate. So the estimator in this case for this, uh, dynamics for this missing dynamics is given, we, we just use the kernel embedding uh, technique, which I will describe later. Okay, so for, for the time being, I'll just tell you, this is just a linear estimator, okay. Uh, then you can see that basically, you know, um, the, the left panel, which shows a result trained using 50,000 data point, okay whereas the right panel using uh, uh, 500,000 data point. Now you can see actually using more data than the trajectory tracks 
much longer in unit time compared here about closer to maybe 160 or so on relative to this is 15 right so now uh, to 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 re relate with this uh, uh, to, to, to relate with this, uh, uh, the, the theoretical estimate here. Now, suppose if we assume like the target function in this case, this guy, the G here, is a very smooth function. So in this case, uh, beta is infinity. Then basically the minimax error rate is suggesting that epsilon is just going to be order n to the minus a half. So it's just Monte Carlo error. Then you expect your uh, prediction uh, time uh, for the accurate prediction to be on the order of n to the quarter. So in this case, it's about 15 on the left. So they're kind of agree. And on the right is a little bit more conservative. So it's like 26 and so, okay. Uh, now, we also uh, show other statistical comparisons such as uh, PDF here. This is the Auto correlation functions, uh, also mean exit time, tau zero here denoted, and the other variable is the reaction rate because this is just basically uh, a bimodal potential problem. And in this case, as you can see, basically uh, the estimates uh, trained using longer data points give more accurate statistical estimation, right? As you can see, the dash here, they are the one, those are consistent with the full model. And also this columns is actually much closer to the true value relative to the one trained with less training data point, okay? So now let me go into uh, uh, the case where basically the data Y is not given, even if it's given, it's very, very high dimensional, okay? So, here, uh, let's say, given only the data of X and the dynamical systems of the resolve variable, which we don't know, denote it by script F, let me define theta, okay, as, a, as the identifiable unresolved variable, such that basically X, I plus one, so this is the dynamics of the resolve variable, can be written uh, as a function of x and theta, where theta can be, you know, uh, depending on x and y, okay? So simply put, you know, let me just uh, give you an example so, so, it's that, so that this is, can, can be clarified. So here, an example here, suppose, okay, the full dynamical system is just a Fourier truncation of cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is given by these equations, okay? And now uh, you can, you know, uh, imagine, suppose that the resolve variable, which is, we call it X here, right? It's just the U0, which is the zero Fourier mode, right? Because of uh, U0, then the cubic term here, this is basically vanished because K is equal to zero. Then the dynamics of the mode zero is given by this equation, right? Now I can actually, uh, uh, take out the component that depends on U0 by itself. And then here's the remaining. And I will define this as theta. So this theta, this is basically what, it is an example of uh, identifiable unresolved component. So in a sense that if we are given only time series of U0 and this particular equation here on the bottom, then you can extract theta, okay? Or you can identify theta by just plugging U0 to this and do a discrete approximation to the time derivative in this case, okay? So I, I hope this is clear what uh, is theta, okay? Now, uh, in this particular uh, case, uh, since we can, uh, we, we can actually rewrite the full dynamics in terms of X theta. So here I'm going to do that, okay? So basically the dynamical of X right now in terms of X and theta is given by this function uh, operator F tilde. Now uh, I use the Maurice Wansik representation, uh, okay, for the time evolution of theta here, where M is large enough such that the delay embedding theory is valid, okay. Here I also want to emphasize that I want to rewrite this in terms of conditional expectations. Okay, con condition to 
uh, a variable z, which is defined as the memory of x and memory of theta. So, you know, then basically our ultimate goal is just to use uh, machine learning methodology to basically uh, approximate this conditional expectation, or this is the target functions, okay? Now, in this case, uh, consider here's my closure model, okay? So you can just compare, oh, sorry, this is, I missed the tilde here, okay? So you can just compare the two, okay? The only difference is like the approximate model. Now I use, here's my approximation using uh, expectation to the power of epsilon. And then in this case, uh, I also add a, a Gaussian uh, noise, okay? Uh, with variance estimated from the residual of approximating this guy, okay? Uh, in this case, you know, to, we, I add this, you know, to, you know, combat the fact that maybe in some cases uh, the target function does not belong to the appropriate hypothesis space that is used to approximate this guy, okay? And uh, theoretically, you know, I mean, although here I just denoted by Gaussian, uh, theoretically, basically, it actually also works if this C is any local martingale such that the Burkholder Davis Gundy inequality is valid since we use it in the estimates below. Now, uh, suppose that this estimator also consistent, okay, with variance error of order epsilon square, exactly like in the previous uh, results, okay. Now, uh, assume that this projection operator PM acting on the Kuban operator U is uniformly bounded. Uh, this is basically saying that if f tilde and g, okay, they are Lipschitz on x and theta, that's, that's all it is, okay, then we can deduce the, the following, the trajectories of the solutions of the true model and the approximate model will agree, you know, up to some finite time, okay. The bound here is, I should say, is rather loose, okay. Uh, for chaotic dynamics, I believe that uh, the coefficient a, you know, should correspond to Lyapunov exponents, but this obviously requires further study and you need to put some structure on f and g maybe to understand this a bit more, okay? And uh, the proof of this is basically relying on a very old theory of dynamical systems on perturbed vector field of ODEs, okay? So now, in this case, uh, I will consider uh, the uh, a particular uh, uh, choice of uh, recurrent neural network called long short memory term. This is a popular uh, RNN, basically, to model this uh, this conditional expectation. So basically, let me use this notation PM as the neural network based model here. Um, since you know I'm not qualified to say too much about LSTM, let me just say that this is just you know a nonlinear estimator that is obtained by solving this uh, minimization problem in this case. That is to seek for uh, parameters W, which is the parameters in the neural networks that depends nonlinearly on this cost functional. Uh, basically, in this case, right, you know this is a very highly uh, high dimensional and non-convex optimization function, okay? And you just apply this training, okay, to approximate this estimator. So here we test this, you know, uh, we, we, we are going to test this approach, okay, on, uh, uh, on an example. So here the example I choose, just the kuramoto sifasinski equations. So here in this case, so this is just the configuration of the full dynamical equations. So specifically, uh, the true will be the true uh, dynamics will be constructed using forty-eight Fourier modes. We will resolve only the first six modes. Okay, so here's the first six modes, and this is this is my theta. So theta is just the identifiable unresolved component. So it, this could this is like the other summations here that you know can depends on uh, these six modes and all other higher order modes. Okay. So our closure modeling framework is basically to couple this theta with this particular dynamical 
uh, non-parametric dynamical equation in this case. Okay. So now uh, let's look at this uh, uh, non-parametric estimator here, right? Each component uh, of this vector V and theta, they are basically six dimensional uh, complex value variable, each of them, okay? So, or, or 12 dimensional real value variable. So since there are two of them, there are 24, you know, uh, a vector of size 24. And if I put the M here in our experiment, we use 20, then this is indeed, you know, a, a, a 480 dimensional function approximation problem. So this is what we got to approximate using the training data set. Okay. So in this case, you just basically uh, employ the LSTM to approximate this. Okay. Now in the next slide, I'm going to show you some results. Uh, first, this is to compare, uh, what is this? This is the uh, spatiotemporal as a function of time error difference on prediction uh, with the same initial conditions in this case. And on the right, basically we provide uh, RMSE over average over a thousand out of sampling data and compare it with the bare truncation model. Basically this approach give you a much accurate uh, prediction skill in terms of trajectory. Uh, the bare truncation model here is basically just ignoring the contribution of theta. So basically you just cut this theta and, you know, run this uh, truncated model. Okay. So now uh, here's a uh, more detailed estimates. Uh, so one of this is actually the truth and this is the closure model. Here's just uh, basically the evolution of uh, the first Fourier modes in this case. So panel D and E is the autocorrelation uh, auto and cross-correlation between what is it, mode one and mode four square in this case, right? Here's the PDF of the one of the mode. And this is just energy spectra, okay? So, you know, this is just one example that I show you um, in, okay. Um, basically, you can find more examples in the papers, okay? Now, uh, let me continue. A little bit. Okay. So the last uh, part of the talk, I want to discuss uh, the following things. Okay. So I would like to use this uh, closure framework to understand parametric modeling. So to begin with, okay, let me basically review several basic facts about RKHS that I personally found important. So first, okay. Uh, kernel, okay, let k be the following function. This is a kernel if it is symmetric positive definite. Uh, and RKHS, okay, okay, is defined as follow. Let h here be a set of functions, uh, be a Hilbert space, okay. Then we call this uh, h to be RKHS if the, if, if, if the kernel is a component in h, okay, and for every function in the space, the evaluation of a function on X can be expressed in terms of inner product. The importance, uh, uh, another importance property uh, that I learned here is basically the following, right? If X, uh, if K is bounded and continues, okay, then for any sequence that converge in H norm, in the RKHS norm, then it is also converge in uniform norm, okay? And also basically the kernel uh, provides a means to the regularity of all of the function in the space. For instance, in this case, if K is bounded, if the kernel is bounded, then all of the functions are bounded. If K is M times continuously differentiable, then so does all of the uh, function in this RKHS. Okay, so now let's say I have two RKHS, okay, H and X hat, X, X hat here. Uh, each of them are, you know, correspond to the kernel K and K hat, okay. Now the idea here is, is, is as follows, okay. The target function, which is, this is what we are after in, this is the closure modeling framework that, that, that I proposed in the previous slides here. Suppose this is belong to H hat, okay? And uh, the random variable theta here belong to, to, to H. 
then you know the theory of kernel embedding is saying the following you can actually evaluate this functional you know through this inner product okay basically what this says is like this particular term here is just a the the, the risk representer of this functional and here you know by definition of a join you can rewrite them as such where you know what is the c c's are just cross covariance operator that uh, generalize the classical notion of cross covariance operator with respect to theta and z and z and z okay so there's a, a, a very nice review article by these guys actually who invented this uh, um, statistical uh, estimation now, uh, as far as uh, what I'm under, uh, what I'm interested in is is actually is actually the following. Okay. Now I'm going to review what the so-called kernel tricks here, but I'm going to use it in the reverse row. Okay. So first of all, under appropriate assumption here, basically compactness, uh, the Mercer theorem states that one can actually represent the kernel as the following inner product of to infinite sequence in little l2 space, okay? So where this sequence of features basically, so this VKZ, you know, is depending if this is a real value kernel, then these are sequence of real numbers are, are basically just a feature, okay? Now, um, uh, okay, I should also mention that basically here, what is this phi? Phi is just the orthogonal basis of L2. That is also the eigenbasis of the uh, uh, appropriate integral operator defined with respect to the kernel. Okay. I should also mention that, you know, uh, for non-compact domain, uh, one can construct a class of what I call the Mercer type kernels, because there's no compactness there, induced by uh, appropriately weighted L2 space. And then uh, the kernel embedding is, can be connected to the polynomial chaos ex, uh, expansion, but, with, uh, but, but the series expansion now is actually understood in the uniform sense. So you can check out this uh, paper by Zhang, uh, Xiantao Li, and myself, if you wish. Now, the idea here is the following. The kernel trick is to avoid uh, this uh, inner product of these features of evaluation of these inner products by resorting to a particular choice of K. So now let me just use this or look at this in the reverse way. Let's look at the expansion in terms of this feature map really, okay? And specifically, you know, the closure model that we that I proposed earlier can can be can be written as such, right? By this sort of generalized Fourier expansions, if you wish, where basically you can approximate the the the, co the expansion coefficients here uh, via Monte Carlo using the uh, kernel embedding mean formulation, which is maybe which detail maybe is not that important here, right? But but the point here is the following, okay? So here's the key point. Uh, if I do a finite truncation here with M, finite summation truncation, this linear estimator becomes just a parametric model, okay? It is a consistent estimator, okay? In the sense that it converts uniformly uh, as M goes to infinity after uh, the data size goes to infinity. Now, here, basically, if you look at this carefully, we just turn uh, the problem of constructing closure model into a problem of specifying a basis function of Hilbert space, right? Because you know you need to, you know, represent this in. You can represent this in any basis you want, right? For example, in this case, right? If I use a POD basis as this fee, right? Then the closure model, you know, simplify to this. This is just a linear model in Z. And look at the coefficient here. This is just a solution to a linear regression problem of Z to theta, okay? So this becomes a very simple linear, parametric linear model, right? Also, let's just say if you choose phi other basis, let's just say it's a polynomials, right? Such as Hermite, or it doesn't have to be orthogonal. It can be any polynomial you wish. 
then basically what you're going to obtain here is just a parametric model in terms of polynomial of degree m in this case. Okay. So now to close this talk, let me just uh, demonstrate a numerical example okay, using this parametric representation. Okay. So I'm going to test this on uh, truncated burgers half model. So this is a Galerkin uh, projection of infisit burgers equation introduced and studied by Maida and Timofeev in 2000. So now uh, I should say, in contrast to the infisit burgers, this equation has no shock. It has an equipartition spectrum, meaning that each uh, mode is statistically equally important. Uh, however, dynamically, the leading Fourier mode decays the slowest compared to the next mode and so on and so forth. So here we're interested to predict U1. So we consider given data set of U1 and U2 and theta, where theta is defined such. So in this case, I'm going to do this. Okay. So I'm just uh, uh, interested in predicting U1. So I'm given only this data. So here's my theta. This is my theta is my uh, unresolved identifiable component. So our closure model is just given by this, okay? Where you couple the dynamics of U2 and theta, okay? So in this case, uh, I will uh, basically test the case where N is equal to zero. So that means the closure model only depends on U1 and it is independent of U2 and theta, okay? And you can see the if you don't depend on U2 and theta, then the blue curve here, this is actually the worst prediction. They are not agreeing with the true that is agreed by the other thing. So here uh, in this slides, basically on the top, I'm showing the statistics of uh, density estimation and autocovariance. In the bottom is just the, uh, uh, the time, uh, basically the trajectory statist, uh, of the estimations. So to conclude here, okay, is that we provide a closure modeling framework here, which systematically identifies the appropriate target function to achieve pathwise convergence. So one can use any estimators in this case to approximate this. Uh, and in this case, I show several estimators, including the kernel-based linear estimator, which uh, has a convergence guarantee, okay, uh, but, 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 uh, but you know, suffers from curse of dimension. And the nonlinear estimators uh, produce basically state of art numerical result, even with weaker uh, notion of convergence. So, so here, basically, let me close the talk by listing the following uh, sequence of press, uh, papers. So here I just order based on the description of the, um, of, of the talk here. Uh, although the research is actually done in reverse way, and here's also another reference discuss, uh, uh, that discuss uh, related tools that are used uh, throughout this uh, research. So let me close the talk now. Um, and if you have uh, questions, we'll talk about that later in the discussion sessions. So thank you for your attention.